All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, whichever it is where you are located. Thank you, everybody, for for coming to um, our fourth day of our 10th annual installer conference. Um, this <clears throat> is our first virtual conference, so we want to thank you all for coming. And today uh, we are talking to MT Solar. They're going to go over uh, their presentation. And then um, we have um, S5 and Tamarack Solar following that. And then finally at 3 p.m. is the open networking session in which all three manufacturers will join uh, for further um, virtual trade shows um, and tables. So um, I also wanted to remind everybody that this is NAVSEP certified. So what Alti will be doing is um, collecting all of your emails and um, we, will e we will send that over to MT Solar so they can issue the certificates. Uh, but for now, I'd love to hand this over to Travis to start the presentation. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll get going on this thing. So, uh, and, and is my camera still working there, Andrea? Yeah, you're working? good, Travis. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so ground mounts. Why to go to the ground? And as Gary Tuttle was talking to me a while back, he's like, you know, people aren't always sure when to go to the ground. And I thought, well, we'd cover a couple of those basics. There's a lot of reasons for it. And there's also a lot of reasons to go on a roof, but for some of the ground mount stuff, obviously no roof penetrations or leak concerns, no need to take the mounts, the modules back off if you do have to re-roof. No roof engineering concerns, that's turning into quite the deal on some projects. You do get better module efficiency and cooling, and it's significant enough to note your optimal tilt and orientation, of course, if it ain't pointed at the sun, it's not gonna make as much power. Shade and snow cover, okay. That can go both ways. You can be preventing shade by getting it out away from, from whatever you've got for obstructions and you can get rid of snow. It also can be used to provide shade or snow cover uh, for either agricultural or for, uh, for vehicles or lawnmowers, whatever. And obviously these low mounts aren't gonna be a lot to that. We'll speak to that more. Easier snow clearing and maintenance up to 20% increase in production. And we could have an argument all day long about how much production you're gonna gain. I've got customers that claim incredible numbers. I think some of them aren't realistic. I've got customers that are that are you know much more realistic, but I think this 20% number is pretty fair. Okay, so we have a couple of product lines. We have our ground mount line, which you'll see here, which is a driven pile uh, design on this one. So no concrete on this site and lots of posts. Fast install, fixed tilt, and you got a lot of different ways to deal with your foundations. Uh, we're going to breeze through that. Here's again the same idea. This was for utility uh, for a community solar project. And these were all driven piles. So here's the kind of different ways to deal with a foundation. You're going to have a shorter, and I probably should have drawn this with the concrete having been shorter. The bigger diameter the concrete is, the shorter the foundation the less you have to grab. So we put a spade plate on the front of this one and we've done that before to get the depth shallower or you can just drive the pile straight in the ground and all those are options. You've got to resist the overturning moment of the wind somehow, some way. So if you have a smaller engagement surface, you're gonna have to go deeper. There's just no two ways around that, which is why Sometimes you want to go with a concrete foundation. Ground clearance can be cheap insurance. I, I found this, this system out in Massachusetts. I was out there driving around with my wife and we drove by this uh, brownfield site, greenfield site, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it was like, pull over, we got to go get some photos. And went out and took some photos of this. And, and it's really sad. You know, somebody went to a lot of work to build this system. They put in a really nice system and it's now operating at what? Maybe maybe 50% capacity, maybe less. As we all know, you shade one corner of that panel. You probably lost that panel depending how the strings are done. So just a very sad situation. And trying to remedy this here is going to be tough. We're either going to need to sterilize all this ground, you know, spray it. Now we got to go in and what manually weed eat it because we can't get equipment in there. Um, 
you know, same story here. Once you get a problem and a good share of the world, you can have this occur within what? Less than one year. So you have one time where your grounds maintenance guy got cancer and he's, he's off for the year and, and you didn't catch on soon enough, or maybe some investors put in a solar system and they don't pay attention to it, you know, turn their back on it for one year and you got this problem. Now you got to go in there and try to remediate that. So it can be to your advantage to get your mounts up in the air. But what we're going to dis what we're going to discuss here today is that the higher you go, the bigger your foundation gets and the bigger your structure gets. So we are constantly dealing with trade offs of do you want a low upfront installation cost or do you want a long term higher production option or maybe some other reasons that you want to get this thing up in the air, get it up out of the out of the, the danger of physical damage or something else. So our top of pole mounts, this is what's put us on the map. This is what we've been doing for, for many years now. And this is, this is our standard top of pole mount product. We can go up 30 feet in the air with this if we need to, or we can keep it down low. If you are gonna be mounting our pole mounts quite low, maybe you're doing it for the adjustable tilt or something else, sure, that's fine. Um, you're gonna end up with a smaller foundation the lower you get, but you do have other options that you might as well go up. I mean, the cost of that, you know, buy once, cry once. That cost of that concrete and that little bigger pole to get that thing up above, you know, above physical damage height, above agricultural height. I'll show you some photos a little later on of some reasons for that. Uh, again, here we have our adjustable tilt, higher ground clearance, faster install time at higher clearance. That's a big one. When, if you're out estimating an electrical job, I've been a master electrician for many years. And if you go to, to estimate a commercial electrical job, a big question is going to be, what's the, what's the height? You know, so if you're bidding a job that's got an eight foot ceiling, it's going to be a much cheaper labor value than if you're bidding a job that's got a 15 foot ceiling, say it's an airplane hanger or a 20 foot ceiling. Well, on our solar arrays, if we're doing four high, five high, and we're going to build that thing at tilt, and we're going to do a decent sized array, it's not at all uncommon for us to be starting at 10 feet, and that's with almost no ground clearance. So as soon as we start getting this thing above snow, that can be a real variable. And generally in the estimating world, we would estimate double the time. As soon as you got above, you know, seven, eight feet, you know, where you're having to get up on a higher ladders, we'd estimate double the time. So we've seen that on the installs we can cut our install time in half by hoisting the array instead of trying to build that all at height plus of course the osha issues to go along with that these are all jobs i've done in the past uh, that's me up on a ladder i think i was taking the photo on this one this one's down in california rolled down and helped a guy out for that job um and you can probably name the brands on all these i, I know i could but we're not gonna they aren't they aren't ones that montana solar made you know we we started out installing other people's product and then went on from there. So this is conventionally what we would done. You'll would have done. You'll see other photos like this through through our different stuff. Um, build them on sawhorses. Bring in a crane or something. Hoist them in. You see, this is a classic case. This one's for the Eastern Washington University. They were doing a a study on their grounds there, and we had to do a tenon on it. So we had to go with a ten inch pipe, and then we had to do a tenon to convert it to eight inch because there wasn't the option with this product to build it with a 10 inch pole cap. And you'll notice most Montana solar mounts can be sourced with many different sizes of pole caps because of some of those concerns. Scaffolding, trying to work up there in the snowy environment or trying to deal with cranes, just not a lot of fun. So nice to build that thing on the ground and hoist it up, wire it, <laughs> no climbing around with a man basket trying to wire your mounts and then just hoist the thing to the top when you're done. Okay, so a little bit of discussion about the tilt. Some people that have never used, well, anybody else's mounts or our mounts, um, aren't familiar with the concept of a, of a single axis tracker. So conventionally, all of your pole mounts would have a plate on the back. And I don't have any photos of that, but any of the brands that we've all used since forever back would have had a, a plate with a number of holes on it. And so you climbed up there with a ladder on the back of the pole and you unbolted the plate. And now the mount is free. It's free to tip and to swing. And so you unbolt this plate and you adjust it 
now and generally you're going to know any of those mounts that are that way in an off-grid scenario because it's when you drive up to the house you'll see ropes hanging off all four corners because you know you had to get somebody's brother or their son or their wife or something to come out there and hang on to ropes and try to you know and try to you know wrestle this thing back into the right spot to catch the next bolt hole because it's all floating three and we had too many off-grid people with installs that just couldn't deal with that. So we started building screw adjusters actually before we even started manufacturing Montana solar pole mounts. And this job is out on the East Coast and this guy has a nice little renewable farm here. And Gary, this is Gary Tuttle, our sales guy, was out there visiting with him and, and shot a little video clip. And you can hear him talking here. He's talking about adjusting that thing. See his cute little goats running around. Really enjoyed it. He really enjoys being able to tilt this thing and let the snow slide off um, and be able to work with it that way. So it, very quick and easy to adjust, which has been a, a big a big savings for a lot of people. And let them let us truly call this a manual single axis tracker. So you can adjust this thing for eight, 10, 12 times a year to optimize your sun, to get rid of your snow, some people with bifacials are using it to cap things you can do there with that okay how do i get to the next one there we are so this is a mount that's installed without the last panel put in for those of you who have not done one of our pole mounts uh, if you do some of the smaller mounts like a top eight you can leave the get everything installed leave a gap between the between the columns and modules and be able to hoist that without having to without having to put the last module in. Um, obviously, nobody likes getting that last module in. It's a bear. Uh, we do find that this is one of the best methods, either off the front like this, or I recommend using an extension ladder leaned against the face uh, if the ground's a little more level. Um, to put that last module in, Go up there with a flat screwdriver and a wrench and you can tip it in there and put it in with the tamarack um with the tamarack clamps there is a strut nut that goes in there you know a quick wrap of electrical tape around the tamarack nut when you just because you have to disassemble the clamp to put the nut in behind as a nut goes goes in there before you put the panel in so a quick wrap of electrical tape around the nut will keep it locked in place so it doesn't slide on you uh, with the aluminum on aluminum it can slide real easy so that can make sure that when you climb up there with that last module and you set it in of course these two clamps are already in and they're 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 just like normal but these top two clamps you'll want to make sure that you have the nut in place and it's in the right spot before you go to you know and then take them take the clamp apart you know you got the top part with the bolt in your hand and or in your pocket you climb up there and set that module in and then use a flat screwdriver to adjust whatever you need to and, and put those in. It takes some time, uh, but it's better than trying to do it all at the top of the pole uh, by, a long, by a long shot. Okay, some of our customers have done a wonderful job trying to deal with terrain, trying to handle all of that. You'll notice this one has you know, bigger foundations on the lower sides, and that's gonna be because it's got more load. You know, It's just like using a cheater bar on a ratchet the, the bigger and longer the cheater bar, the more torque you've got. Well, the wind is up there treating this pole like a big cheater bar, and it's trying to twist this pole over. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll use this, this moment to, to tell a little story on myself. Many years ago, many, many years ago, I, we got a request from a, a customer to install a a little grid tie battery backup system. So we went out and put them a little wind turbine in and put in a couple of these little nine module racks. And this is back when modules were small, um, when the world was young or whatever you say, but I'm still young too. So I can't, I can't say that too much, but I started young. Um, agricultural field. So I had a challenge on my hands and I'm, not, I'm an electrician by trade. Uh, I've, learned, I've learned to be an Imagineer, but I'm not an engineer by trade, I'm an electrician. So Customer asked me to do this. I go, okay, yeah, we can go get this done. Um, so we went out there and I got some rough dimensions from the pole mount manufacturer. And I, I noticed that they said, you know, the ground clearance should be fairly low. 
Uh, and well, yeah, I get that, but what's that mean? You know, it said maybe 18 inches or 24 inches was the recommendation. It was a little bitty sauna tube and not very deep in the ground. And so I go out there in the excavator and it's like, well, okay, it said three foot, it said a two foot diameter and, uh, you know, four feet deep or five feet, deep, four feet deep, I think, and two foot diameter. So I need to go get sauna tube because it says it wants a round hole. So if it wants a round hole, then that's what I should do. So I go out there with an excavator and we dig a hole and it's blow sand. I mean, it's just, it's just sandy. So we set the sauna tube and we pour it. We set the pipes and we do all our due diligence. And, um, you know, there's a little closer look, you know, I'm, I'm like, man, I, I need the tractor to clear this thing because they farm this regularly. So I need the trans right on the edge of the field. So I need the tractor to clear this. So let's get it up. I mean, let's, let's clear the tractor. I, I can buy a little more pipe. That's not going to hurt anything. And I had a little bit of checking, I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know how much to increase that foundation. I think I bumped it up a little bit, but I didn't really know, you know, whoa, whoa, I don't know. Well, let's try it. So I put it in and I, I thought I'd done a perfect job, you know, I backfilled around it and did all this, you know, and I got the sauna tube in. Of course, I had to dig a four foot. You can't dig a three foot, you can't dig a two foot hole, four foot deep, unless you've got a special auger and it's sand. So I'm having to dig it with an excavator. So I ended up with a four foot, probably a four foot round hole ish. And I dig this hole and I set the sauna tube and I put it all in and we're wrapping the job up. I think I was overdoing the, the wind turbine a little later and I roll in down the driveway, which is kind of between the house and the wind turbine there. And I look over and the two poles are skewed from each other. They're, they're no longer plumb. I think, oh no, and I went over to ask the customer. It's like, yeah, I said we had a little microburst yesterday. It was, you know, almost hundred mile an hour winds and, and we were quite, you know, wide open and we had this problem. So we, uh, you know, you'll fix it. It'll be all good. So I went out there and of course we hand dig it all. And we, we brought in, you know, more concrete and poured a great big pad around it. We made sure and went through and did all the, all the, all the math. And the customer didn't need engineering. There was no need for an, a stamped engineering pro, uh, package on this. This was very rural. Uh, this customer was, d didn't want more people paying attention to their site. Uh, we didn't need permits. This is very rural, rural area. Um, and, and this was some years ago. So I learned something there. And after that, I was like, well, I've got to figure out how to calculate the extra force that happens when I have a longer pole. And here's some more photos of that. You can see it's right on the edge of the field um, and right on the edge of their yard. And you know, of course we were trying to you know, set it in with a telehandler and you know, that's how you do things is what it is. <laughs> here's what it looked like by the time I was done. I added big old you know, foundations around it, went way down deep and, and it was fine and it worked good. So, that being said, I think it's it's a good chance to segue into discussing our, um, we'll, we'll pop through and see if there's a couple more slides. So these are multi-poles. They have the very same concerns on a multi-pole. And obviously this one has a lot of clearance. This one has a little clearance. This one has more clearance, less than that one. Okay, just so you see there's all these different variables. Okay, so on our website on emptysolar.us, so you can see I'm just on the website, just like anybody else would be. So go there to a uh, top of pole mount calculator. And some of you have seen me do this before and, and go through these. So just a quick refresher, put your information in. These calculators are constantly changing. We're always trying to update them. And I do have some, some really exciting news that I hope to share with everyone uh, soon to make this process even easier, but I'm not at liberty to say it yet. So hopefully some more good things coming, but just, just watch this top of pole mount calculator is where you'll find the latest and greatest of what, of what there is. So 60 cell mount, top 12, 35 degree tilt, six foot ground clearance, all these variables and front edge ground clearance, that's at the front edge there. Um, and if I change any of these things, you know, if I go up to hundred mile per hour, uh, it's gonna change my support pole size and it's gonna change, you know, a, a number of different things here for, for more well, everything, it's going to change it all. So we want to go through and just for, for information's sake, I'm going to show you our back end calculator, which is the same thing. And I wish that I could provide it on the front end, but unfortunately the method that we're using to get this launched does not let all of the, the photos from the spreadsheet show. So I'm going to show you what it looks like. Same, same inputs over here, what it looks like on a drawing if you're gonna if you're gonna be putting this in so if i go 60 cell top 12 and notice that i've got a five foot seven depth on the foundation right now and i've got a 6.81 feet 
to the top to get a three feet front ground clearance. So if I would have done, you know, like the old uh, one I, <laughs> I messed up back in the day, if I'd done 1.5, 18 inch front ground clearance, which is 1.5, that's only a 5.31 foot pole. I don't know what you were looking at for photos on that thing that I just did, but it was it was a pretty substantial. Um, and it was only a nine module. So let's be honest here and, and do this the same as we were, as, as my old debacle, just for information's sake. So let's do a two foot diameter and round. Okay, so seven foot deep. Um, these are a little bigger modules even than I was using back then. 35 degree tilt. Yeah, that's not bad. I can go out there and do a two foot diameter, you know, seven foot deep hole. That's, that's not gonna be horrible. Um, but what happens if I do a front ground clearance now of 15 feet? Now again, watch, we're looking right here, 4.37 feet and I've got a seven foot depth. I hit enter. I went up to a 10 foot foundation to get this thing done from a seven foot to a 10 foot. Now I can also play with the, the size of foundation. I go to a four foot and I'm back down to an eight foot foundation. And if I go square, it's gonna make it even smaller because I get to count the corner to corner dimensions on it. Okay, that's all fine and good. So let's get back to something that's probably reasonable. I think a 10 foot front ground clearance, I do not consider unreasonable at all. I could even do an eight for a lot of these people that like to have, have them a little lower. Let's go back up to a top 12 just for interest sake because I always do all my stuff on a top 12. That's our, one of our best sellers. Okay, tilt at 35 currently. And I'm seeing a seven foot foundation. Uh, snow is um, ground snow load 40 PSF. Let's, let's go zero here just for, for interest sake because it doesn't, so now you'll notice snow does not affect my foundation. This, our pole mounts are centered on the array. So the snow is gonna sit on top of this thing and the forces are gonna be driven straight down through the foundation. So there's almost no effect on the foundation or on the pole size. Very common to end up with a, um, well, okay, we'll go into that discussion later. But it's very, very common to end up with a small pole and a small foundation if I have a lot of snow, if I'm a fairly flat tilt. But inevitably, if we have a pull mount with a lot of snow, we're gonna to wanna to go to a steeper tilt and there's a lot of other times we want to as well. So again, watch these numbers. If I go up to a, say a 75 degree tilt because my customer wants to, to dump the snow on this thing, I'm gonna to have to go higher to be able to clear still an eight foot, but let's 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 keep this honest. You know, we, we should have kept this number accurate, but I'm solving for this value. So we may have to modify our front edge ground clearance down to six feet to get us to approximate about where we were here. Eight foot, eight point six foot foot there. And if I go down to a um, 35, 6.4 feet. So you're gonna see these foundation variables change so much. Six inch schedule 80 is all I would need for this install. If I'm at 35 degree tilt in six inch schedule 80, 35 degree tilt. If I go up to 75, boom, I'm gonna to have to go to an eight inch schedule 80. So the way you choose to install the mount in the field affects what you need to order significantly. Zero snow, I'm not gonna have a need to go to a heavy duty mount. But if we take this thing down to a 35 degree tilt, again, flat, relatively flat, 35 degree tilt, and we put Truckee, California, anybody? 250 PSF snow? It's gonna be a custom. It's too big. We can't get that many modules on there. I might be able to go down to something smaller. Um, we do have a number of mounts in Truckee, California, but they're uh, generally built up a little bit. So a more common snow load that's significant. I've still got a fairly small pull because my load isn't there. I'm still a standard duty on a top 12. So everything's working quite well on that one, quite quite honestly. I don't need to go to a heavy duty, but if I were gonna try, okay, the customer said they want a few more modules, let's throw in a top 16. No, I'm getting lucky. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're coming out good on this one. So 
that this is where we can go through and keep checking all of those and not have to get into knowing if it's a if it's a heavy duty and that same information is over here so again you're looking at your ground snow loads you're looking at your foundation types you're looking at your standard duty with rails or your heavy duty and this net will now give you a skew to actually send you to the exact mount and you can click up here and go to product and it'll take you right to the right one so that you can go order it right there Okay, let's go back to, let's see here. Yeah, we're just getting lucky and staying on standard duty all the way through. I love this. And that also is some of what you're seeing now with, so now we're into a heavy duty. With some of our mounts, uh, you're gonna start seeing more standard duties available in the larger mounts as we're doing more and more of this engineering it doesn't always make sense to just go grab the first frame size. So it used to be a customer would come to us and say, well, I want a top 20. Well, we just sell you a heavy duty or an extra heavy duty, depending on, on which frame, you know, which mount you're ordering. And we weren't really paying attention to it. And we would size your pole and your foundation and that information. Well, now we're trying more and more to help you whittle that pencil a little bit by tweaking your in, your environmental conditions to get the right size frame, not just foundation pull, but let's get the right duty class of frame for what you're doing. Is this a wind load? Is this a snow load? What are we chasing? And that's why we put all of this information in here so that you can determine if you're gonna be ordering a heavy duty, an extra heavy duty, um, you know, all these different things and, and, and what's gonna be kicking it. And you'll see, <laughs> If I try to do a 15 degree tilt, the snow won't slide. I do a 20 degree tilt, the snow won't slide. I'm at extra heavy duty. If I get this thing up to a 40 degree tilt, I'm down to a heavy duty. So there's a time and a place to run steeper tilt to get rid of snow. And then you need to pay attention to your wind and it will cross back and forth. There comes a time where you'll, there's actually a point where, where those lines will intersect, where if you go any steeper than this, the wind's going to affect you. If you go any flatter than this, the snow's going to affect you. But your customer wants to adjust it. So now you need to make some judgment calls about which way do I need to go if I want to be a standard or a heavy duty. Okay. Um, let's carry on with where we were here. Okay, stress analysis. Obviously, this is what engineering is all about. You know, we're trying to determine with all of those loads, with the heavy duty or the extra heavy duty or what we are, where these things are gonna start getting hot spots and how much load it's gonna take. We're looking forward to here in the next couple of weeks, we're gonna be uh, setting some of our ground mounts up and piling plate steel on them until they actually break. And we'll do destructive testing and video all that with the engineer present and you know continue to try to get the most out of our mounts that we possibly can. This was done in uh, SolidWorks with the full finite element analysis and. Uh, done to it. So this is the calculator that I was showing you a minute ago. And here's how those uh, those dimensions are on the website. So again, at the bottom of this screen is a way to correlate those values. Unfortunately, I've not yet found a way to make them show up on your end, where as soon as you change them, it changes the dimensions on the graph for you. Unfortunately, you have to correlate them yourself by pulling the data out of here and putting it you know, manually into here to go out in the field. Um, I do believe that we have a solution coming up soon to make that better, but I don't yet. Okay. Ground mounts the same way. There is a ground mount calculator. We're also going through it soon and hoping to get it a little more streamlined and hopefully full span tables on the ground mount calculator so that we're not having to redo the calculations every time. Um, just for interest sake, you know, I, I grabbed a stack of books here. So this is what you would use, you know, were you engineering these or to, or to come up with those designs. And incidentally, those calculations for those of you that have some electrical experience are very similar to the National Electric Code. It's a stack of, you know, this is a stack of books. Each of them is about equivalent to the NEC in size, but they're very similar and they're written very similarly. So just like on the NEC where you have special special purposes and you can choose to 
you know, calculate your, your wire ampacity by the circular mills, or you can choose to calculate your wire ampacity by table 31016. But if it's a house feeder, it's 31015B2, and it's no longer 31016. And if it's a flexible cord, it's going to be 31016, but it's going to be farther down in the table because that's a different kind. Same story here. When we're dealing with engineering, we have the same issues where we need to design it. it is this thing a monoslope pitched roof? Is it a freestanding wall and sign? Uh, are we dealing with, uh, with any form of, of uh, earthquake issues? Those are all the stuff that your engineers are going to be plugging in. So you can get a design recommendation using our calculators and they will work, work just fine. I um, wonder if I get the chance to go back here. Oh, well. Uh, the issue is that uh, there. When you go to the engineer, just like if someone, one of our customers goes to the code and tries to determine in the NEC, you know, what size wire they need or what stuff they got. When we come out there like, man, you, 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 you missed it. You missed grabbing a voltage drop couch or you missed grabbing um, some other variable in this whole thing, uh, future expansion, whatever it is. So the same thing with our engineering and at this point in time, if you are going to get a stamp, if your jurisdiction requires stamped engineering with calculations, I strongly recommend that you maybe go through quickly and get some some rough pricing data, um, you know, get a foundation calc run, but don't don't you know marry that thing and go buy all your materials until you've gotten the engineer to get the stamp letter and calculations back to you because Otherwise, you run the, the very real risk of the engineer saying, no, 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 we needed to apply this table or this information, all these different different situations. We needed to apply that to your job based on what your county or jurisdiction required. And we, we need a small change. So that is the challenge with stamp engineering. Now, we do hope to be addressing that hopefully within the next, next six months by next year. At this meeting, you will probably hear um, some good things from us about that, that we've been able to bring those two together and that's what we're working on. Um, but that requires us using a solution that the engineers will certify, which means we are having to approach some, some larger players and ask for integrations into our site so that we are all using a software that everyone can get their name behind. And that software has to encompass this, you know, four inches worth of books not just one particular section, but it might need to encompass a number of sections to do uh, design checks and load checks against all of it. Just like we can't expect to go wire an entire project with only reading two or three pages out of the NEC. We need to, we need to approach 690, we need to approach 250, you know, all of Article 300, all of these different sections. And of course, you know, your Article 100 covers all of that stuff or your Section 100. So that's where all this stuff comes together with the engineering is do your calcs, do your due diligence, figure out on your design, what do you need? Not just go order something that may or may not be the right thing. Now, that being said, out of thousands and thousands of amounts that Montana Solar has sent all over the, all over the world, um, thankfully, we build everything extra heavy duty enough and robust enough that we have yet to have a structural failure with the, with the core structure. Um, as, as different ones of you have have ran into occasionally you might have something with an adjuster and it's a moving component and or some other thing that the engineers didn't uh, didn't calculate or didn't help us out with and those things have all been fixed you know, subsequently as we move forward with with design iterations and changes but we've not had an issue with that so i've had customers that have said they were buying an exposure b which means very sheltered wind loaded mount and they've uh, said that it was going to be uh, low to the ground and it's going to be a fairly flat tilt. And so we sell them one and we give them a foundation recommendation. And a year later, they send me some photos and they're like, yeah, this mount's really neat. And it's sitting on the edge of one of the Great Lakes, right on the edge of the water, which is not exposure B as in boy or C as in Charlie, it's D as in dog. So we jump two whole classifications, which is next to open water, and the thing's sitting up at a steep tilt to shed snow. And I'm like, wow, I'm glad that we aren't seeing failures with that. And, and you know, thanks to our guys and to our uh, engineers for building some factor of safety into our products. So, Janelle, did I miss anything?
Or you got any questions I need to address? Um, one installer was asking about using a 36 inch auger and um, what he would do if he hit rock. And so you might just want to touch on the different foundation options with pole mounts and ground mounts that you can change your foundation once you get into the field if something like that happens. Absolutely. Um, of course, assuming you didn't get a, a full stamped engineering package because the engineers like to have every detail ironed out and they want to charge you extra for everything you vary. Um, that does bring up a good point. I'm going to cover it a little later from the electrical standpoint here with the grounding and bonding with the structural steel, but it brings up a good point that one of the reasons that my mount um, here many years ago on this job, one of the reasons that these things leaned on me was that I use sauna tube and that keeps me from having good contact with the earth and I have to be terribly picky with soil compaction and that's really brutal. Um, so I, I really recommend that you dig a hole or auger a hole and pour straight to the dirt and the engineers are very adamant about that. If you're going to get stamped engineering, they're pretty adamant that that's the way they would like it done. Do not use sauna tube. Well, okay, you're going to spend a little more on concrete, um, but you don't have to deal with backfilling. And with OSHA and everything, you know, you can you can paddle out a, a a pretty good sized hole, set the pipe in it, and you know, and drop your cage in there if you do choose to use rebar. Um, which again, I could go into a rant on that too. But the the part about the 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 round foundation, you hit a rock. Well, you you can dig that thing to be a bigger hole, and you. If, if you're just if the customer doesn't require the jurisdiction is what it comes down to it's not the customer it's the jurisdiction if the county you're in or the state you're in doesn't absolutely mandate you must have a stamped engineering you can jump on our calculator and change that right there in the field on your phone and grab a foundation size that's going to work and you, and you dig a bigger hole and just you know throw a few more yards on the truck and we'll even tell you how many yards of concrete is on the truck on that one so that's a a, a quick way to take care of that problem um yeah, square holes versus round holes. You can auger a hole. Uh, an auger is wonderful with like a 36 inch auger and I've got some customers do a fine job of it. I, I decided I was better off to bring in a mini excavator to the job and I generally dig mine square. Um, and I like to use a four foot by four foot hole. I've got a lot of customers that try really hard to stay with a two foot diameter hole because it uses less concrete, but then they have issues with cave ins and they're buying so much more steel pipe. I, I think that there's sometimes that that's not actually cost advantageous. I think you are probably best off to go with more of a four foot square hole because you can actually dig it as deep as you need to get. Um, any smaller than that, you just can't get the bucket down in there to dig it out unless you do have an auger. Now, if you have the auger system already and it's, and it's part of your deal, that's, that's fine. Um, if you are going to go that route and you are going to auger a small hole, I recommend at that point that you, that you consider rebar or consider something to, uh, to to reinforce that concrete so that you can only embed the so you only have to embed the pipe you know maybe three feet or four feet into the into the concrete so you don't have to embed you know uh, literally eight or ten feet of pipe underground and buy that extra pipe but you know you can kind of go either way. That being said, on the reinforcement side. These code books, so this would come under the IBC code, International Building Code, and these code books do not have a section in them that discusses unreinforced concrete because concrete in and of itself tends to fracture and crack. So it's very uncommon in the building industry to drop a, a, a pipe down inside the concrete like we do. It, it, generally, people go to rebar and anchor bolts. So the code is set up around that and they don't have a way to deal with the with the unreinforced. So that empirically we've done, I and, and many, many of you have installed pull mounts for 50 years. Uh, I haven't, but, but many of you have with uh, no, no rebar at all. You just dig a hole, you stick the pole in the hole and then you backfill it with concrete and you make sure that there's enough there to do it. And you know, great grandpa's shovel that's leaning in the corner has still got concrete on it from his day. So concrete's a pretty good glue. Uh, but that being said, allegedly, you know, the, the, the concern is that 
from the code standpoint is that they can't promise that there wouldn't be a fracture from top to bottom that would allow the foundation to open like a clamshell and let the pole escape. Um, I guess I would call that one and say, uh, but whatever. So rebar is not a requirement for Montana solar, but it's a requirement for, from uh, most engineer, most if not all engineering firms will require some form of reinforcement of the concrete and the code just basically doesn't doesn't address unreinforced concrete. It just it just ignores that as an option. Did I cover that, Janelle, or is there anything else? Yes, and two people have asked about earth screws or ground screws. So if you want to quickly touch oh, on that. Yes. Okay. Uh, we need force at ground level, like right where the grade hits. That's where this thing's going to try to try to move or snap or do something. So to embed an eight inch diameter ground screw way down in the dirt, but now that little eight inch pole doesn't have very much grab against the soil and it'll, it'll knife through the soil. So you end up having to go really deep and, and reinforce that, that ground screw. The way around that, and traditionally you'll see it on power poles and other places, is to work with the ground screw company to install a number of like, a, like an inverted spider, um, or, or an actual spider uh, into the ground of like four or six of these smaller ground screws that require a, a less expensive ground screw machine to, to put in. You, you, some of them are quite economical, some of the peer techs and some of the others. And then install a, um, a what do they call that thing again, Janelle? Do you remember what they call that plate they put over the top of that? Not a batter board, but it's a, anyway, it, it, it's a plate. The glorified plate that sits on top of all those, all those, and then allows the force to be transmitted at an angle down into the different ones because ground screws do really good at pull out, but they don't and, and push, but they do not do well at side load at all. So you need to put a number of them in to, to take care of that side loading. Anything else? Last quick question, and then you probably need to move on to codes. Um, but one customer was asking about how the tilt adjuster stops. What locks it into place when you get to the tilt you want? Wonderful question. Don't have an adjuster here with me, but if you buy one of our, our mounts at the bottom is a, is a little nut that's, that's right above the chain link that creates the pivot. And that nut has got an Allen, an Allen screw in it that locks the nut. So the nut's a split nut with an Allen screw in it. And we've got a stack of, uh, UHMW ultra high molecular weight plastic, uh, industrial oil impregnated plastic for lubrication, uh, a stack of one of those washers, a rubber washer, a steel washer, then the mount, then another rubber washer, like this whole stack of, of these rubber and plastic and steel washers that create a friction ring, like a brake against the bottom of the adjuster. The adjuster is just an acne screw. So you can adjust the tension of how hard that, that screw turns so just the, the breaking effort on the screw by how tight that nut is turned. So you use a small Allen wrench in it. I, I didn't think of bringing that information, that stuff over here. I could have brought one over from the shop, but you use a small Allen wrench and you loosen that up. And then we just leave the Allen wrench stuck into the screw head and use the Allen wrench itself as kind of a wrench then to twist the nut around, you know, half a turn, if you will, to tighten it up or to loosen it uh, to get that right. Uh, once, so oh, maybe two or three times a year, I get a customer call me and say, well, you know, I got one that's self-adjusting. Um, and that's what they do. They go out there and, and tighten that up. Most of ours, you know, our guys are pretty good at setting that to a, a pretty good tension to where it, it's not too hard to turn, but it's got just enough friction to give it a, to stop it and lock it in place. Okay. How much longer do I have, Janelle? Um, oh, 15, 15 minutes? minutes. And <laughs> At the end of co at the end of grounding and bonding, if you have time to talk about carports, there's been a lot of questions about carports. But I also said network the networking session would be a yes. Good that's a good idea, guys, because we really have about ten ish minutes left yeah. to kind of wrap up. <laughs> okay, as you guys noticed, the code is not silent when it comes to grounding and bonding. I love this topic. I had an awesome instructor. Uh, in trade school that I had to sit through many, many Saturdays and listen to preach and preach and preach grounding and bonding and how that all works. So we're going to spend about 10 minutes on grounding and bonding when it comes to pole mounts. So 
you got a single, I'm just, just going to show a single pole mount here. You have a grounding electrode right here. And let's be real clear right away, the difference between grounding electrodes and bonding is one is to take care of lightning. That's basically all it's for is lightning. That's what those ground rods are for. If you're going to try to move current through them, you're just, you know, going to make earthworms angry. You're not really going to get anything done. They don't, they don't do well at anything other than dissipating lightning. So we're looking for a way to get lightning away from our system and into the ground where it's trying to get to anyway as quickly as possible. So that's the job of a grounding electrode and the grounding electrode conductor, which is in Article 250 of the code, 2566 for the electrode sizing. So 250.52 is where you cover your grounding electrodes. I have a lot of customers asking me about where they should be installing ground rods or how that should all work. The fact is that if you go through 250.52, again, 250.52, um, and I, these, these sections are probably some of the best, um, A2, A3, and I'll go through a few of them. But this is, the unfortunate thing is, unless you had a really deep foundation where your 10 foot or more embedment, which is a slam dunk, you're going to have to ask your inspector or get get sign off from him basically, which I normally do just when he shows up at the site and I throw a ground rod in the truck and make him put it in, or maybe you throw a ground rod in as an auxiliary anyway. But we're not 10 feet embedment generally. So we fall under this metal in ground support structure, but we also fall under concrete encased electrode, which would be a U for ground. And then we fall under plate electrodes, which is 250-52 day seven, or other local metal underground systems or structures. And these can all work together. So there's really, there's not any issue with just treating this as a ground rod or a grounding electrode is what it ends up being, not a ground rod, right? And as I'll show, you get to use, now you can have auxiliary grounding electrodes, um, and you can add as many of them as you want, and nobody has a problem with that. The code has no issue with you having ex additional auxiliary grounding electrodes. And here, just so that nobody will yell at me, uh, it says the same thing in Article 690. So again, Article 250 is the grounding article for the code. It overwrites everything else in the code, and it is the underpinning that everything else is built on. Article 690 is specific to the solar industry. So we do go to Article 690 to double check to make sure that what we're doing in 250 has not been modified. So anything in 250 stands on its own unless 690 modifies it. So we look to 690 and it basically says, yes, you know, Article 250.52 and 250.54 are fine and we can use them. And it says the metal frame of a building or structure can be used as well. So our, our, our uh, racks are built to the AISC, American Institute of Steel Construction manual, which is the same as a steel building. So anywhere you see metal structural frame, now we could have an argument within an AH day and an, and an authority having jurisdiction is the end all of all arguments. So if you're not comfortable enough in your code to spend it, you know, 15 minutes on the tailgate going back and through these sections to help him understand that no, you really are falling into these classifications. So be it. I'm always glad to talk to them too. Um, been a while since I had too much issues with AHJs, but they're 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 good people. Most of them, most of them are pretty decent. Okay, so that's all about the grounding electrode and the grounding electrode conductor and how that works. Now we have bonding. Bonding has nothing to very little to do with lightning. Bonding is about clearing the breaker, or in our case, you know, eliminating objectionable current from current from non-current carrying components. That's how the code would read it. Basically, it's saying if I lick my fingers and touch something metal, I don't want to get shocked, right? I want to equalize and bond everything that could carry energy. I want to bond them all together. This is not about lightning. This is not in Article 25066, but this is in Article 250, but it's in the bonding section and grounding, not in the electrode section. So buildings and structures, the best place here is to start with 69047A. And we are not solidly grounded on almost any of our systems. If it's got an MPPT tracking system, it's going to be 
a um, functionally grounded system, not a solidly grounded system. AC, we actually ground one. We go out to the power pole and we literally grab one of the phase conductors that we're going to use to make power and we hook it to a terminal and we ground it down. On solar, we used to do that on some DC coupled systems, uh, non-MPPT tracking systems. We used to do some of that, but now almost all of our systems are functionally grounded systems and they're not solidly grounded. So you're looking for these that are saying they're not solidly grounded. You know, they're basically saying we need one. Um, the metal equipment shall be considered grounded if it's under the normal conditions. So we're basically going to say our stuff is grounded if it's all connected together as a steel building. And it's going to be grounded by being connected to the structural metal frame of a building, but it shall not be used as the required equipment grounding conductor for AC equipment. And I think the code is going to basically agree that, that what we're in, what we're doing is going to be very similar. So we're basically saying we shouldn't be using this as the only ground path unless it's a fully listed structure, which is a nightmare on a whole nother layer from a code perspective. And it could be done, you know, we could try to list this, but it's going to limit what we can provide for you and, and the ability to just treat this as a structural steel building. So we're best off just treat it as a structural building and not, and not treat the thing with the, with the other, with the other side. So exposed structural metal is interconnected to form a metal building frame and it's not intentionally grounded or bonded, shall be bonded into the following, the grounded conductor. So basically when you go through all of this, what it's saying is when you bring your number 10 bare wire out from, uh, you know, from the service and you're bringing it out to land it on this thing and the reason it's a number 10 is because if you're using uh, uh, 251 and you're running number 10 uh, power conductors, you only need a number 10 ground, right? But if, it, if you're up to number eights, number sixes, whatever, you may need a larger one. So you're bringing your wire up and you're going to just bond it to this pole because this pole is allowable as a grounding electrode conductor. So now that's going to tie to here. And I can also just bond my ground rod to this pole if I do have to add a ground rod. And then I take my rails, which I believe I have yeah, photovoltaic module mounting systems. So this 69043 is what talks about the UL listing of the rail. So the Tamarack rail we use is UL listed. So is every other rail that you're going to find. And that UL listing says that we can use it to bond the solar modules. Now, we could also go through the hoop nanny of getting UL to certify our clamps and certify our connection here and certify our connection here and, cert and go through all this stuff. But you're basically getting a very minimal advantage to the whole thing. You're better off to just run a cable and grab every other rail, one rail per column, and go ahead and bond that system. It's, it's going to be the cheapest and best for you um, and for us. If we try to go through the whole UL listing with all the different modules we have and with the structural steel requirements that we fall under, it's going to be a big old schmozzle. So we do, we do use the UL listed rail bond it using UL listed clamps and bond it using that conductor. Now there's one more. That being said, this one bit us uh, some time ago. 251.22c says you basically got to run a number six because it's too, it, it might be uh, having issue of physical damage. Um, now I always maintain that if you're running it along the top of this array, there's no way it should be able to be affected by physical damage, but I've lost that argument before. And we've, we've kind of just gone and run a number six on everything, but you could also make a case with your instructor, with your inspector or if some one of your guys ran, you know, something smaller that it is installed within hollow spaces of the framing members of the building or structure and not subject to physical damage, which means put it underneath the modules, which is in a hollow space of the module you know, between there. Now, is the inspector going to say, well, then that means you need to sheet the underside of your module? Maybe. Welcome to AHJs. You never know. Um, and this is basically saying, too, that if you're running more than one circuit out to the ground mount, so maybe it's a, you know, it's an in-phase system, right? And the panel's back at the, at the house, and you're running, you know, six circuits out there instead of putting the panel out, you know, out at the pole. Um, 
then you're going to be you're going to have to run you know extra ground rods and stuff same thing if you're uh running in phase and you run the service out there and you have a distribution panel on there yeah you're going to have to run ground rods you have to do the grounding electrode stuff from the previous slide if you are running a high voltage uh mppt uh um sma system and you only have a single circuit you may be able to make a case because it's a single circuit that you could get away with it but more than likely article 690 is going to come into play and is going to bite you and say that no because we are a solar structure we still have to put in grounding electrode conductors but this is one of the sections under 25032 d that you might want to glance at just to understand when you need to do those and when you don't and i think i ran out of time so any other questions on that janelle do i got more in there no, we could probably open it up to general questions if there's time or Andrea, are we out of time? Yeah, I think, I mean, you're obviously getting responses of an excellent presentation here, Travis, as usual. So thank you and, and Janelle for your support too. I think, um, you know, it's interesting because the carport question, you guys presented that as the presentation at our conference last year and, and um, you know, it's coming up again this year. So that would probably be a good one for the networking session this afternoon. <laughs> Why are you shaking your head, Travis? <laughs> because there's such a challenge to get, so to get the carport installed way up in the air and yeah. not centered. It's easy if you can center the poles underneath it, like sure. north, south, it's super easy, but trying to get a cantilevered system through engineering. But I, uh, I guess uh, believe that I am still trying um, and I've got a couple new ideas that I'm cooking with. And one we have presented last year we kind of had lackluster interest in it. It's like, well, okay, that yeah. isn't totally worth driving through. So now we've been trying to find a cheaper option. But our standard pole mounts work well for carports. We sold a lot of them as standard carports, um, five high. Uh, you can try to get to six and seven high, and that's when things get a little dicey there too. But yeah, we'd love to visit some more and some, okay. some breakouts and specific projects. All right, thank you team. And really thank you all for attending and uh, more to come later this afternoon. Thanks everyone. Make it a great one. Bye, Travis. Thank you.